Hello, everybody. My name is Joy. Uh, I'm talking from Germany. I'm representing the Makers for Humanity NGO and our project Open Island. It's about floating islands. And I have the honor and the pleasure to uh, open this uh, international conference on floating futures. And uh, we are hosting this from our houseboat in Hanover. And uh, I welcome you to join the discussion. We are live streaming on YouTube. And uh, let's go and see who is there. We have invited um, island makers, builders, and uh, interesting people from all over the world. And uh, we started with a vision workshop, so we will hear the uh, results of this uh, two-hour workshop, the design sprint. And uh, I'll hand over to Nico Löser from the Institute for Art and Innovation in Berlin, uh, who is moderating the conference. So let's go. Yeah, hello friends, visionaries and innovators. It's great to have you all here. And it would be wonderful if you write in the chat where you join us from. And thank you, Joy, for this warm welcome. But I also would like everyone to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished uh, speakers for today's Floating Futures Conference. We have Cesar Jung Herada from Singapore, Richard Sober from Brazil, and Joy Lohmann from Germany. But before we hear from our expert speakers, let's acknowledge the creative minds uh, who participated in the vision workshop in the last two hours and prepare to pitch their forward thinking ideas that we are now eager to explore. So a round of applause for the talented teams that dedicated their time and creativity to the vision workshop. And with now, uh, with further, with not, without further ado, we have three groups ready to share their inspiring pitches, each lasting uh, up to five minutes. So let's welcome our first pitching team. They circled their ideas around floats for ecosystems and the virtual stage is yours. If you like to share your screens, then please do so. So who would like to start? Michael, you want to start? Michael, Michael should start. Okay. So Michael, you are still unmuted. Can you hear me still? Yes, yeah, now okay. we can hear you. Yeah, because we have, yes. I have to remove my headphones as well. So um, I just have to check, or maybe uh, have you all the load? For ecosystem slide in front of you on the mirror board. Otherwise, I. Woody, Woody shares his screen. So now we Are can you, see. You share the screen. Okay. So, yeah, we. Um, we discuss, uh, discussed about uh, problems that are somehow related to <laughs> ecosystems. Um, I can just introduce them maybe, uh, maybe just briefly because we have only five minutes and some other parts left. So yeah, what we identified was uh, that especially in riparian areas along rivers and coastal areas, there's a lot of habitat loss because of human um, use, land use. Uh, this includes species loss. Um, you also have the problem of maybe invasive species. Um, um, we have the um, uh, yeah the point human versus nature, which is maybe monocultural uh, agricultural war, which also actually affects ecosystem by destroying them in huge scales. Um, 
unfortunately, land use practices, mining. Um, we have stuff like eutrophization. So you have a lot of nutrients in water bodies, which can be negative for some species. Overfishing, noise and light pollution. Of course, there are other environmental factors that could be affected, but these are some that are um, very problematic. And then we also thought about geographical and climate impacts such as sea level rise, ice melting, which is of course connected, CO2 enrichment, cyclones were a specific case in, uh, in tropical areas, for example, Malawi, uh, coastal erosion, but also, for example, green space availability in urban areas. Um, these were some problems that we identified. I, uh, yeah, unfortunately, there will be more probably. And solutions. Uh, that was then nice because if you have the problems, then you can see or think directly about the solutions. Can you maybe go to the solutions, uh, Budi? Yeah. <clears throat> so just some things that we have. We have uh, here permaculture and circular economy as a thing, um, which we also have some applicable ideas later in a, in a Lake Malawi thing. Um, vertical farming, increasing vegetative cover in general. Um, big thing would be ecosystem regeneration, of course, where you can do it against climate change. You can often, you can't often generate your ecosystem fast enough uh, for the climate change thing. Underwater farming, habitat provision for yeah above and below water, um, water purification, removal of pollutants. Um, um, yeah, you can plant plants for human use or plants with conservational significance. So these are some uh, solutions that we have due to the time, <laughs> the short time. I think this is still not a um, complete list, but uh, yeah, at least some inspirations on the theoretical level. So then I will hand over to you, Joseph, to uh, show us the Lake Malawi thing. Okay, uh, thank you so much. So like uh, on the, uh, with, with regard to uh, Lake Malawi, so uh, one of the uh, critical challenges has been in terms of uh, the decline in the water levels and also uh, the increase in water pollution because of um, unsustainable agriculture practices. So this has a very significant impact on the water and um, as such, we are looking at um, exploring large floating structures um, using even biological agents like um, the plants. But then we are looking at uh, the right choice of plants that do not end up also uh, causing or creating more other problems instead of um, yeah filtering and absorbing the pollutants in the water. So this is one way like uh, of uh, planting the um, uh, plants like we are talking about the water hyacinth then um, it appears like in some places they are having problems with this uh, water hyacinth so we are looking of course at um, appropriate choice of plants that we can use to at least try to reduce and um, the the pollution in the water and um, the, the other challenge was to do with um, the wetland deterioration um, where more cyclones are happening now in Malawi. And because of these cyclones, they have very significant um, devastating impact on the water ecosystem, but also even uh, on the uh, surrounding communities that depend on the lake. So we are looking at uh, promoting uh, like permaculture, but in an ecological way, so that we reduce the volume of chemicals that I find their way into the water system, but at the same time, um, using bio fertilizer, which uses um, less harmful chemicals, um, and and also exploring on uh, having these large uh, structures on the water, just to um, also promote uh, this way of thinking, uh, and also maximizing the water Thank spaces. You, Joseph. Yeah. Joseph. Thank you so much. Um, but you also have a second vision. And uh, even the time is over for your group. I would also give uh, the word for one minute to Budi. Okay. So just real quick, um, 
in we are tackling um the ecosystem using system that's what the my vision is so and if you want to look for <clears throat> information there i provided link and maybe some uh, people can provide link in the youtube channel or something like that and then they can talk to me more about it but that's just because the times is up um i just want to say uh the uh you can look up the mirror boat uh board and then look at uh this uh interlink of system that i created for the people in uh for the um sea nomad <laughs> Uh, called Bajau Laut. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for this um, manifesting of visions and already creating floatable and floating futures for us. And now we are curious what team two came up with. So we have the flow team for architecture. The stage is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, could you give us uh, sharing rights, please? Because I can't share. Ah, now, now it works. Perfect. Yeah, I was on a um, very inspiring, or we were in a very inspiring two group workshop with um, Udo. And um, yeah, well, I will uh, take it uh, from uh, from uh, the end. So to start where we end. So um, our ideas were about. Um, smart and alternative workarounds for bureaucratical problems, individual and community solutions, and a quick and easy start. So our problems we identified were on one hand um, buying land uh, in um, which country, um, Udo? Um, in I Uruguay. Know. Yeah, in Uruguay, oh, but also uh, Joy gave, uh, gave me personally a, an example in Hamburg. You always need uh, building permits, but where you don't need one if you build it on a pond. So that is like a, um, a solution. And uh, we will share later a prototype. And the second version we brought in were um, <laughs> the perspective of loneliness in, in cities and how to solve that. And um, so we, we when you imagine yourself uh, being lonely in a city, many people go uh, and search for a place for longing, which they find on um, riverfronts. Yeah, and so and we we took like the community aspect of riverfronts and went from building um, an island on a pond to building an island on a riverfront, so that each one of us <laughs> can create its uh, uh, her or his own personal um, starting point um or jetty um yeah and um so you can uh uh even solve a different kind of environmental problems because you uh, you don't interfere with the riverfronts and even build different solutions we will come later on and then we went uh to prototypes of buying land um um, and that's where where I think I hand over because there we have our most concrete prototype and I'll, I'll hand over to to Udo and just um, join in so he can his uh, uh, yeah present maybe his future of uh, or his vision of a of a solution. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Thank thank you very much. Um, Yes, I would uh, like to uh, present this vision number one now, and uh, I'm here right now working in, in living in Uruguay, and um, it made uh, it came across me that a lot of people um, that are starting to develop their uh, their property um, want to do something uh, that makes them a little self sufficient and want to start to make uh, permaculture. And, and grow vegetables and then so they need water and that's the first thing uh, that they um, uh, they need to establish and then the second thing is uh, something to stay the night um, on, and to live just for uh, when they are building their things and yeah it's now with this um, uh, uh, with this happening now, um, it came up uh, um, my idea to maybe you can join these two things because here in Uruguay, a lot of people start to make uh, a real big swimming pool or a pond 
um, where they use the water for agriculture or swimming. So um, I thought it was would be very interesting um, to to think uh, what what happens if you use this water uh, or a house on the water, so you don't need uh, another piece of land uh, to use, and also you have a very good. Um, uh, effect that the uh, water doesn't evaporate so fast. So there the, the idea was born to make a sleeping cabin um, on a pond. And uh, yes, here I don't think if it's, um, if it's possible to see um, now on the presentation, but uh, there are some photos of a, a small first uh, sleeping um, cabin that I wanted to build in the garden. And now with this uh, happening here, uh, the idea is born to make it in a swimming pool or in a small pond. And to, um, yes. So I think this is more or less the, the vision of um, this floating for architecture. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, and and then another solution we came up uh, what you can build is uh, we went also to to combine both uh, on the uh, ponds or riverfronts that you can uh, build uh, co-working spaces and hubs maybe restaurants or the yeah uh, and uh, our main object was not to create standardized um, <coughs> tiny houses which are already kind of in a certain way but that we give each stakeholder, each um, yeah, uh, uh, company maybe a ch chance to individualize it and uh, personalize it the way it is. Um, yeah, it has been shown. And we went even further than cre uh, creating uh, that, that I really liked creating a voucher system to, um, to, uh, um, to also implement an alternative um, paying uh, assist, uh, yeah, paying uh, uh, or tokenizing system. Uh, which I found also very promising as an alternative. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was really uh, marvelous. Uh, so many cool ideas. And um, now we are curious what team three uh, came up with. So uh, the, the team, the stage is yours now. Is there also someone who uh, shares his or her screen? Okay. Um, I don't think I don't think that we need to share the screen. Yannick, could you do the presentation? As I'm just speaking with ah, there is uh, Caesar already. Hi, Caesar. Okay, so we do no share, uh, shared screen, right? We don't need that. Oh, uh, I don't think so. Okay, cool. Um. Okay, I, I just start, but I still get for myself the screen. So, hey, uh, I'm I'm Yannick. I'm 22 years old. Um, just that you know, I met Joy like one year ago. We did the cool art event at the Documenta. Um, and my energy is kind of coming from Burning Man because I'm going there every year and I'm in the desert and I'm like building things with other people and they all like like have a hand on something. Um and I was uh, calling Joy like a few weeks ago, and I and I told him, "Hey, we could we why are we not building an island in the desert, like to show all the people that that like uh, what we can do with trash and like how you can um, recycle something and and like build a community with those islands." Um, and yeah, that's like kind of the idea. It's not it's not about Burning Man. It's more about festivals and more like bringing sustainable sustainability to festivals and like. Bringing um, education for um, sustainability, ed education for um, upcycling and recycling on festivals, and start to do something with a group. Start to do something with all the people on the festival, and like have hands on, and also give them a knowledge and give them a worth they can they can work with, and also like make an art piece with those people and then use those this art piece for example you can build you can build an island on a festival um and maybe they have a river next to it or maybe the next festival has a, has a river next to it and so you can use those islands for the festival and bring like a a, a worth 
to the festival and to the organization. Um, I think that's that's the basic um, words for me. Um, the benefits are awareness, teamwork, and togetherness to put hand, hands on and a more sustainable lifestyle. Thanks for listening. Joy, if you have more, you can you can go in now. Uh, thank you. Um, we have, uh, with Open Island, uh, several times uh, performed at uh, festivals, the Splash and the Melt Festival in Germany, which are located directly beneath a um, flooded coal mine. And there is also a museum, an open-air museum of the Anthropocene. So this was a perfect location to um, to show uh, a new way of uh, the Anthropocene uh, to uh, to see what uh, man-made islands uh, could uh, be of benefit. So um, we had a floating energy island there and a floating uh, garden, of course, a floating stage, um, and uh, some facilities for leisure. Um, time and um, we we um, did it as uh, workshops for the festival goers and this was uh, very uh, interesting and uh, uh, they all loved to to do something hands-on uh, a part of uh, being stoned uh, at the stage <laughs> at the different floors so we could uh, provide a, a good place for a community building uh, to learn something, to exchange um, ideas, and uh, to build a community. So, so this um, we want to uh, standardize, standardize with an art piece, a mobile art piece, which can travel from festival to festival. And we will collect messages in the bottle as the initial participation format. So all the people can um, provide their ideas, their fears, their wishes for a future and to put it into a bottle. And this are the floats where we will float on with these uh, um, platforms on the festival. Um, in the desert, we don't need a floating Island, uh, but uh, still we have uh, the the transfer of this idea, and uh, can combine it with an artistic um, presentation, uh, multimedia to to show existing projects, and, uh, and then we could even in the desert of Burning Man we could bring the people in their imagination to the floating grounds all around the world. So that was the idea, and uh, I think it's feasible. Um, and it would um, attract uh, like-minded people and also the media to to get uh, more attention to the worldwide decentral projects. Thank you so much. That was really marvelous and impressive what all the teams have exchanged in this short time and also came up with new ideas. Really wonderful. A big thank you to all the teams for your inspiring pitches. But now let's dive into the innovative world of uh, floating futures with our expert speakers. After their presentations, we will have a brief Q&A session. So keep your questions ready or write them in the chat so we can uh, let them answer after. Firstly, we have the honor of hearing from Cesar Jung Herada, a versatile French Japanese designer based in Singapore. And beyond his expertise in design, Caesar is an environmentalist, educator, and entrepreneur. And he is showcasing a profound passion for ocean technology, impact innovation, and education. Currently, he is also serving as an associate professor of design at the Singapore Institute of Technology. And he's also pursuing a PhD in design and ocean innovation in France. Next, we will have Richard Sova a remarkable carpenter, artist, and singer-songwriter who made a transformative move from the UK to Mexico in 1997 and today joins us from Brazil. Richard is also an environmentalist and artist and has crafted floating islands, for instance, one using over 100,000 recycled water bottles. And his unique approach to sustainability through art is both inspiring and impactful. And finally, 
we are delighted to also welcome Joy Lohmann. Um, he already um, said a lot about his work. He is a German artist with a long-standing dedication to floating art since the World Fair Expo 2000. And Joy's creative journey has led to the development of modular DIY float platforms known as the open islands that we could already hear from. These platforms um, are also conceived as social sculptures, so means that they host art and culture on their floating stage, contributing to numerous exhibitions and shows. Joy emphasizes the crucial role of culture in all his projects, from conceptualization and aesthetic as, as, uh, sorry, appearance to project communication and the content presented on the island as a stage or venue. So now, before we delve into the exchange, each speaker will have the opportunity to briefly introduce their current projects and initiatives to our esteemed audience. And Caesar, would you kindly begin by sharing some insights into your ongoing endeavors? Welcome. Uh, okay, sorry. I'll put the timer so I make sure I know 10 minutes. Is it possible for me to share my screen? Okay, I will I will try to share my screen. If you can please confirm if you can see my screen. Are you able to yes, see my screen? Can. Okay, yes. great. Thanks so much. Uh, here we go. So I will start by showing you a video of a recent project, which is a floating solar hydrogen uh, prototype, which is... Uh, Uh, built in Bali. Hidup kita dimulai dari sini. Hidup yang semakin sulit ketika harga semakin melonjak tinggi. Bensin, gas, maupun listrik. Tapi kita tidak punya pilihan. Apa yang bisa kita lakukan? Bagaimana jika kita menemukan cara baru? Bagaimana jika kita dapat membuat energi bersih dari air dan matahari? Tentunya hidup kita akan jadi jauh lebih baik dengan teknologi yang kita miliki sendiri. Balon-balon hijau, our energy from the sea. So what I just presented was a prototype, which we consider speculative design, because uh, although it's functional, it's a very small amount. We know that it's a very small amount of hydrogen that we can produce, but it's also in the context of uh, Bali, Indonesia, where people consume also very little amount of energy. What we found is that if we have a typical fisherman family, uh, if they have uh, one kilowatt of uh, solar panel, <clears throat> but they don't have any land, if they live, you know, because the communities, many of them don't have much land ownership, They could produce hydrogen that they could use for the transportation, for lighting, or for burning. And that could be a significant part of their um, monthly expenses. And um, hydrogen, once you consume it, uh, you probably know you can reuse it as many times as, as you want. So there's, there's no uh, not so many negative byproducts, maybe except the brine from the electrolysis tank. And so based on this experience, uh, because the community or received this uh, uh, concept, they are very interested to push it further. Uh, and because Bali uh, is, is a touristic uh, island, 90% of the, the GDP is coming from tourism, they're very interested in this kind of green energy because they also start having air pollution issues like Jakarta. So we looked at different sites, uh, we started to talk with the locals and trying to investigate the place. We ended up uh, visiting 40 sites And uh, we found one in particular that's really, really good. It's in the north of Serangan Island. And then we discussed with the local, what would they, what would they want? And most of them would say that they don't want necessarily to have one floating solar hydrogen per villager, but they would rather have something like more like a municipal uh, solar hydrogen plant. And so we discussed with the tribal uh, chief, with the religious chiefs, with the heads of school, and eventually uh, we were introduced to four different government agencies and everybody is very excited about the project. We also make a survey of the local biodiversity uh, and also realize that not only we could produce hydrogen, we could also uh, um, pump oxygen underwater. And that would improve the health of mangrove, which are a huge uh, carbon sink. So carbon uh, mangrove can capture four times more carbon than a tropical rainforest like the Amazon, and it can sequester 10 times more. So that's, uh, that's the amount of tons of CO2 uh, per hectare per year. 
uh, that the CO2 can be absorbed. So you can see seagrass mangrove can absorb way more CO2 than tropical forests. And then we continue with the community and we started to do the sketches of what the, the a larger installation could be that could be both production, but mostly at this stage research and also a classroom. And on the right side, we're talking about having a website where we could have real time um, monitoring of how much sunlight goes onto the solar panel and how much hydrogen we produce, as well as the chemicals that are going to the uh, uh, electrolysis uh, uh, machine. So the idea is to do open science and do it in real time. Then we made some models that we keep discussing with the tribal chiefs. And this is the model that we have right now. So it's a 10 kilowatt capacity. And we have secured essentially the, the funds to actually build this platform. So we're going to start building this floating laboratory uh, this winter. And we hope to be in, in operation uh, latest mid-year. Mid so it's basically a floating laboratory. Half of it is electric and mechanical. And the other one is chemistry and biology. Um, half of it would say uh, focus on hyd green hydrogen production and the other one focus on mangrove health and how to increase uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, we have a lot of uh, research questions that we're starting to really lay out very clearly about low pressure hydrogen, uh, underwater pressurization, and using non-toxic catalysts, um, how to improve the mangrove health, and how to make sure that the business model benefits the local people and employ uh, local people and also create IP for local people. Uh, we've already tested the IoT thanks to our partner Seed Studio. So this is our IoT, it's already been tested. And uh, there's a scalability, potentially industrially, um, again, trying to benefit the local population. Uh, I'm going to skip this one, but basically Indonesia is, and is uh, one of the best places with the Gulf of Guinea to this kind of floating solar hydrogen because there's a lot of sun, uh, not so many waves, not so much current, and not crazy um, weather, not too uh, ex uh, extreme weather. Uh, but I want to show you very quickly uh, something that I've just finished last week. So this is another community project work for the uh, coastal community in the Philippines. The idea is that most ocean science now is performed using very expensive technology. What if the global south uh, wanted to develop its own capacity of doing ocean science? What if we could do this in a village environment at a very low cost? And so that, again, it could benefit the coastal community. So we propose this grand vision of international ocean station, but have a very pragmatic approach uh, in a village. How we do that? So I just spent two weeks in the Philippines, starting by doing beach cleanup with the local uh, cleaners, talking to elders and the the, the uh, fish farming uh, fish uh, fisher fisher folks women who are on the fish market, and asking them to draw what would their dream of an international ocean station could be. We also talked to the tourist industry because over there it's also quite big. So this is a floating hotel. Uh, talk to the people who live upstream. So these are indigenous people who are living up the river, who are very uh, caring about their brother and sister downstream. The youth, that many of them want to work in conservation. They really care about the environment. These are um, elder activists that have been recognized to be a tortured victim under uh, Marcos dictatorship. So they continue to fight for um, environmental and for, for the health of the ocean. And also this young man was an orphan. Uh, so he worked as a fisherman as a child. And so he was saying that if he had an international ocean station, he would want to have a shelter for fishermen. Um, and what they say, basically, those fisherwomen, they say that they want to have a fish processing plant and restaurant so they can, to, they can continue to fish, but in a sustainable way. So we did all of this under a tree uh, in a village in the Philippines. And uh, just last week, in fact, just five days ago, uh, we installed it at the Mine Museum, which is the largest science center in the Philippines to continue the conversation with more uh, different people, maybe the Navy, maybe ocean scientists, maybe more people who have different perspective of what this could be. Um, and so the idea is that um, you can see on the left side, this is the International Ocean Station. So it's an underwater perspective. And on the right side is the International Space Station. The International Space Station, there's only one, and it costs $150 billion. And it's only for the richest country, and it was very slow to develop. And it can, only can be used for observing global warming. What we hope is that the International Ocean Station, they, don't, they, they shouldn't be just one, there should be many. And they should be low cost, open science. Uh, built in an inclusive way, uh, we can make them fast. And the idea is that the ocean controls the climate. And so if we can have our feet uh, on the ground or being in the water, this is the best place to develop um, nature-based uh, climate solutions. And so we can see that, that the Philippines could be such a place. So similarly to uh, the other speaker, I guess, I have the same uh, belief that uh, you know to address climate change, we're not going to do it only with science, only with the politics, only with the economy but it's to do with the community involvement, working with art to really create a space of possible and working in open science to actually uh, even build, uh, create the ability uh, to build businesses on top of those crazy ideas and you know experimental things that we build. So yeah, so uh, nine minutes.
Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, really amazing uh, what you are doing. And it is very inspirational and innovative. And uh, following Caesar's introduction, Richard, uh, we invite you now uh, to illuminate us with updates on your latest projects. Richard, Richard you, are you, still... you are muted. You are muted, Richard. Now. Can you hear me now? Yes, wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. It's, yes. A, it's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be part of this conference. And uh, so I really appreciate it. And thank you for, uh, thank you, Joy, and everybody uh, else. And so, hi, everybody. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff come before uh, what I would like to say. Um, for many years, as, as you all know, now since 1997, I've been uh, developing floating islands uh, in the lowest carbon footprint way possible. And I believe that we really need to strictly stay like this when we uh, attempt to do floating structures. Firstly, the plastic bottles are already existing and are causing a problem all around the world. So anything we do with plastic bottles is a benefit before we even uh, make anything with it. If we do something with the bottles and to make a floating island, the bottles are immediately preserved in darkness underneath a platform. And the platform can be bamboo or old chicken pallets. Or, or palm branches even, and then planting mangroves. That's where I, I planted mostly on my islands because I was on salt water. But also for eutrophic lakes, farming can be so much easier and crops can be double or even triple because on a lake, firstly, there's, there's nutrients in all those eutrophic lakes. And those nutrients are actually carbon, giving carbon to the atmosphere. So those nutrients can be used by creating farmland islands all over the world on rivers and lakes. The one I'm doing in Brazil right now is on a, a fresh lake, uh, river and it's flourishing amazingly. And I only put a little bit of earth on the top and a uh, horse manure with just the earth on the edge of the river, which has good nutrients in it. But let me just go back to the islands that I was doing in Mexico. I found that mangroves grow about twice as fast on a floating island than they do on this, the edge. And there's, there's three reasons for that. One is that um, tidal, the tide actually affects mangroves. They don't like it when it's too high because they can't get oxygen. That's why they have those breathers. And when it goes too low and their roots dry out, they also don't. On a floating island, it obviously follows the water line. So the mangroves are so happy and they don't need to put energy into trying to get the oxygen or, or you know, resi resist the dry periods when the water goes down. The other thing is any new mangrove that's trying to grow where mangroves already exist, and as we know, they're being chopped down uh, like crazy around the planet. Um, so this is a way that we can make mangrove islands. And, uh, the mangroves on the floating island like a lot of sunlight. So when you have a new mangrove uh, where they already exist, it's fighting for sunlight also. So it's very slow expansion there. And uh, what was the third one? There was another reason. I can't think of it right now, but it'll probably pop into my head later on. Um, the other one. Um, there is definitely another one. It's fantastic. But anyway, um, the, the eco, um, we heard of blue carbon ecosystems. It's basically the ecological system that mangroves create. And so they clean the water, as we all know, and create life. And uh, it goes on, the, on and on like that. The roots go through the plastic bottles, the plastic bottles are totally preserved. And it becomes stronger with time. And also, so basically, I'd like to talk about, if I've got time, Floating islands on lakes and rivers for farms. Rice production around the world 
accounts for, I think, about 40% of, uh, of, of farmland. And they flood the land usually. And that actually creates methane. It's a microorganism that grows in that flooded water. Now, that is actually damaging the planet and creating more climate change, negative climate change. So we could divert, we could um, divert rice farmers. Firstly, it's so expensive, the preparation of the land. And there's a big carbon footprint in all of that, and then getting water to flood the lands. Whereas if you do them on a lake, you, you, there's, there's now long dry, long dry seasons with the climate change. So the, the rice farmers are having even more problems, whereas on a, on a lake or a river, there is no dry period. It's constantly there, the water. And so the rice grows all year round. It feeds from the nutrients which are bad for the atmosphere in the lakes so or reducing the neurotrophic nature of the lake. It means that you need to put less soil on top of the island. And, and now you're not doing the normal way of growing rice, which is unecological. Instead, you're doing the opposite and you're helping the planet and creating. And there's vast areas of, of uh, lake lands and uh, rivers to do these on. But Joy asked, Joy asked me to talk about the possibility of, of doing mangrove islands in coastal areas, which I was, do, I was doing, and I got through a number of hurricanes, but I was forced out by the uh, local authorities, mainly because of the area that I was in, because of such intense tourism, and people fighting for land to make docks or protecting boats during hurricanes. There's hardly any hurricane... Um, protection uh, areas, and I was in a lagoon, which was particularly used for that site. I'm not specific, because I got the permit, but governments change, and then, you know, the government gets in that wants to make more money, and they push me out without allowing me to put the right time to put the post in that I was uh, preparing to do, and I'd actually already paid and ordered. But anyway, I lost my island to Mexico, and it was not due to the fact that uh, the islands did not work. They really, really improved that they do work. And as our, uh, our friend said, who's in the lab, I'm sorry about it, I don't remember the name, but uh, in French in Bali, yeah, right? Excellent. Um, yeah, um, you were saying about mangroves sequestering up to 10 times. It's true. But if they're growing twice as fast on a floating island, that's even more. And uh, so we could have these floating mangrove islands. And actually get power from the waves at the same time. I've developed a way to having a hole in the floating island where the water comes up and down in that hole and you have a top on it and it creates like a bellow that uh, can turn a turbine. It can create an air conditioner if you're living on it or it can just turn a turbine day and night by the wave power and create uh, electricity. Uh, also an interesting point about the methane and uh, not the uh, not the methane, the uh, that gas. What was it? Uh, hydrogen. Yeah, hydrogen can actually be created um, easy, in an easier way, just by the trash, which is aluminium cans and copper diodes into salt water. And you join them together, and you get a direct current. And in that process of cor corroding in the salt water, hydrogen bubbles come up. Automatically, so you get electricity and hydrogen at the same time. I didn't. I don't know if you know about that, but you may want to incorporate that in your plans. Anyway, um, what else was there? Mm -hmm. Mangrove islands all around the world. Also, tourist islands, which you know, which incorporates beautiful structures to attract the tourism, which would be ecological structures that collect the rain. Uh, cooking with the sun with mirrors, um, a windmill that uh, washes clothes. I've done all these things. And, and this time, uh, all being well, and I believe God is completely with this one here, with the beautiful people here in Brazil. I've got full go ahead. And there's a very good potential for a reality show, which will all help in this. Uh, so I've got a global uh, business plan that incorporates all of these aspects, farm islands on lakes and rivers, 
that can be sold very cheaply and uh, turn trash to ecological treasure, you know. And then also the tourist islands, which can make great money and actually then use some of that profits can be used for farming islands or the mangrove islands, which will be more for cleaning the ocean and cleaning the atmosphere and uh, with more mangroves. But they can be used to calm the water as well. So they can be like breakwaters. Um, so ooh, I don't know, I, I could go on a lot, but basically, ultimately, to actually go on the ocean with an island that can expand and move out to one of the gyres where all the trash is building up, there you wouldn't need an anchor because the island would just stay in the middle of the gyre and the trash would just spiral in towards what you're making. So as Einstein said, matter attracts matter. So we've got what we've got there is like an island, let's say in, in the Pacific or the Atlantic Gyre, and the trash would automatically be attracted in even more than it is now because of the central mass that you've got. It creates actual gravity. I've noticed that actually happening. Trash coming by in the marine system where I was when I was in Spiral Island, used to you could see it change direction as it was floating by, because it was an outflow, and, and it would come over to the island and, and wash up on the shore. So it, it's absolutely amazing making it, we could actually create a new continent. And uh, I have noticed the most, one of the most amazing things about creating one a continent on the ocean is that <clears throat> once you get it over, my estimate is about 100 meters in diameter, all the rain that falls on it, Percolates through, but it can't go lower than the salt line. Salt is much heavier, salt water. Fresh water divides when there's no agitation in the water between the bottles. The water is calm. And so you have a fresh water table on an island as long as it's 100 meters in diameter or more. And the bigger it gets, the more fresh water you have there for your plants. So you could have an island of, let's say, a kilometer diameter on the ocean anywhere and you would never need to water your plants even ever it would just rain would just be collected in there and and you could have bananas and everything so you literally could have floating garden garden of eden islands all around the world with hardly any maintenance at all and just live like my friend joy enjoy eternal i love you all Thank you so much, Richard. That was really amazing. And it's so much wisdom and knowledge um, you share with us. And I would love to hear more also from your global business plan and how we could yeah. Um, yeah, do more community yeah, I think, work. I, I think so. yeah. Send that through. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I also would well, like to quickly give um, Joy the work. And maybe you also would like to highlight. Uh, some projects that are in the realm of open islands uh, that are planned for the next time <laughs> before we then dive into I, the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, I, think under, I, I, did, I, under, I didn't understand that. Sorry, uh, that last. Yeah. So, Hi, Joy. Um, I, will just, I will just quickly give the word to Joy and then afterwards we will have an exchange, okay? Okay, yeah. Cool, thank you so much. Yeah. Let me try to share the screen. Can you see? Can you see it? Yes, uh -huh. we can. Okay. Uh, I actually was not prepared to um, um, uh, give a full speech uh, as um, my vision is already in motion here. We are already uh, uh, joining our ideas and uh, experiences uh, in uh, small but uh, great float community this is what i uh, wanted to what what i'm working on with uh, with the maker for humanity and our own project open island and i can i can show some of the main steps that led us uh, to this point and uh, then i uh, rather want to um, talk with you together uh, about the next steps because uh, our next steps will be community steps. So uh, when I started uh, working with floating islands, uh, 
I was a street artist and uh, didn't focus on water. Um, but we had uh, the World Fair in Hanover, in my hometown. And uh, I had met uh, some genius guy who sailed uh, the East Coast USA with a recycling sailing raft, Christopher Bubbles. And uh, we worked together to, uh, to get a floating art piece uh, on the lake in Hanover. And uh, this was a future raft. It was 100% uh, out of recycled materials with automobile <laughs> tires uh, stuffed with plastic bottles. And uh, then we had these two domes and uh, it worked perfectly as a symbol and as a meeting place for interesting people from all over the world. So I realized that uh, everything what floats attracts the people as well as the media because it's uh, unique, it's something special. And I went on working on with, with art on, uh, on waters and uh, hold on here and uh, some years later oh it has to load some years later i did some floating gardens the future islands um and uh, this was this was an art piece that changed my my mind i don't know why it doesn't work right now oh as oh. always. Now here, there's another one. Um, the floating gardens uh, were um, made of uh, styrofoam, 10 centimeter styrofoam, and uh, I sculptured uh, the world map and planted uh, all kind of different um, uh, plants on top to see which would uh, grow on floating platforms. And uh, ah. it was very interesting because all the plants uh, grew like hell. It was it was a <laughs> instant uh, biotope, <laughs> and and uh, the uh, the birds uh, were breeding there. We had a population of birds on top, and uh, under below there were fish, and it was a uh, it was a paradise. And I thought, well, this is. Uh, much better than just uh, art this uh, this can be a humanitarian uh, innovation which can be uh, spread it all over because there are, there are so many benefits of floating islands and uh, well in germany we have um, a s almost stable climate and um, uh, it's uh, it's much more beneficial in other uh, regions and so i went to to india um, and um, build up a community there, the Makers for Humanity, and uh, that was in Goa. And um, I worked with architects, with engineers, with artists, musicians, and uh, we started um, constructing um, floating devices, uh, um, a floating catamaran, sailing catamaran for the Arabian Sea, and uh, a river boat on the River Sal there, and uh, there. Um, after three years, we came up uh, with this idea of open island, modular floating islands um, that can be built out of recycled materials and uh, can be um, enlarged um, on on the on the sea itself or on, on the lake on on the river, uh, which is possible through this modular system. First, we uh, worked with um, with pallets um, that are available all over the world, as well as plastic bottles, as well as automobile tires. Uh, the com consumer waste is a, re uh, is a renewable resource these days. And uh, we picked uh, the plastic bottles from the beaches and uh, stuffed them into, uh, into fisher nets uh, that, that were the, um, our float devices. And then we put them together to larger units. So um, this was the original idea of um, of this uh, modular system. And after a while, like many people, they they come to, to a new um, geometric um, uh, construction um, um, option. And this is uh, the hexagon, which uh, can be uh, mounted much easier to stable connections. And uh, this is uh, back in Germany directly before COVID, the pandemic, 
uh, I, I took the project back to Germany to, to work on it um, constantly. And uh, this is uh, the prototype for um, six, no, for five um, modules combined with uh, different uh, purposes. And um, um, this is also uh, how we um, organize uh, the whole project. So we have uh, different uh, teams for the different purposes for energy production, for um, education. We have uh, several schools working on these um, projects. And uh, today there was the first presentation of a students group working um, on, on this uh, idea and system. And uh, so this is, um, this is what we have developed and we would love to spread. We have already some, um, some cities that are interested in uh, getting uh, some of these islands on their own water bodies. So um, there, is, there is a lot of uh, options what you can do with it. But uh, the most interesting thing is that uh, with uh, such... Um, hands-on projects um, with with a good purpose, um, you you will attract uh, the right people. You will attract like-minded people. You can connect uh, organizations uh, that um, feel attracted by, by the vision, the idea of togetherness, of um, getting things done, um, which is also uh, the, the idea of our NGO, the Makers for Humanity. And uh, so there are uh, several benefits, and we are now on a point um, where we want to work um, on on the specific purposes, but we can't do it alone. Um, there, uh, with the SDGs, we have um, a good um, a good overview what has to be done um, on the world for for. A, for a um, um, good uh, future for all of us. And uh, these are the SDGs where floating islands can help. And um, we are now uh, looking for partners uh, that uh, work on these issues on floating islands. And uh, that's actually the reason for this conference as well, um, to get together and to form um, a cooperative or, or a, a tribe However, uh, this has to be discussed, and uh, this is what we can do afterwards. Um, well, for us in Hanover, um, we then have decided, okay, we need now one module uh, which can be used as a headquarter, as a co-working space, and uh, this is uh, the, uh, the idea. This was an original sketch for, for this houseboat where we are right now. Um, and uh, this conference for us is also a prototype as it is our first uh, international conference uh, on this uh, small but beautiful Ooh. space. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. and all, all the energy we use here is produced by the solar panels on, um, on the rooftop. And uh, it's uh, fucking cold outside, but here we have, uh, okay, maybe 15 degrees. So this works. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so this is um, what what I wanted to show. This is our history, and um, I'm uh, so happy um, meeting up with uh, all of you. And uh, two of my float heroes, Cesar and Richard, are also here. So um, I, I actually was um, curious uh, how Cesar would um, what what Cesar would say, uh, which advice he would give to Richard um, to to disseminate this idea of mangrove uh, forests all over the world? How can we um, how we can get all these great ideas into into action, into um, distribution for communities, bottom up, open source and low tech? So this, I, this... I, I, don't, I, I don't think I have yeah. a, an advice. I think you're doing amazing. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm just really uh, sorry to hear that you have this political trouble. I think they are, we're going to run in those troubles, all of us, uh, because we are trying to do something new and people have difficulty identifying it. And then if you are, I, my experience is that if you lie with politics, the political landscape will always change. So you can be okay during one election cycle. In the next election cycle, you're basically 
uh, taking a, a huge risk. So it's a very difficult game to play. So um, I, I think you're much more experienced than me. I'm, I'm more like asking you advice. <laughs> you can do this for so many years. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I I have the experience so that uh, at, at the first project I wanted to be political and I had really big enemies uh, because uh, a world fair or the climate conference uh, they know exactly what they want to promote and if you uh, go there and say I have a better idea then they will uh, <laughs> they will stop you yeah. and uh, they have yeah, the, power. the ego gets you. <laughs> so so my my trick was uh, to to be an artist and uh, to do something yeah. which is no of no danger for anybody and to uh, to let uh, us develop um, a better solution which is uh, not in the market but beneath the market so this is uh, an argument for community uh, systems that are not capitalistic but um, bene benefit driven so if no one earns money with it but uh, has uh, can um, can have the benefit then there is no market uh, enemy then then there is nobody who wants to steal your idea if it's only for humanitarian benefit and not, not for profit so this was this is my strategy to work in peace and uh, still do good Thank you so much, uh, also Joy, for the presentation and Caesar and Richard as well. And I mean, that could be also a kind of uh, first question for all of you. How do you consider yourself as an artist and doing the community work? I mean, we heard already from Joy a bit, but is that really a door opener or is it bringing you more harm? <laughs> I, I feel that it's a great door opener. What I wonder is how do you transform it in something that's going to be really uh, durable? Uh, I don't have I don't have an answer for that. I've seen uh, another uh, floating hero of mine who is not present tonight, but he is a uh, Dutch, uh, and he's uh, running the agency Blue Twenty One. Um, what's his name? I can't say he's my hero and not know his name. Sorry, <laughs> but but basically, uh, Ramon you know, Ramon Knester? No. No, he no, built no. a floating pavilion in Rotterdam. Uh, anyway, the, the organization is called Blue 21, and his approach is much more commercial. And um, they have, you know, uh, artists, business card that they can pull, but they tend to present themselves as architect. Oh, yes, Blue 21, thank you. And so I think they are, they are positioning themselves to be building infrastructure that's durable, um, not that what we do is not durable, but, uh, but the aesthetic of it, you know, it's more like, urban environment is, is different. I feel our aesthetic is more ephemeral and more natural, uh, but I think for the politics, they, they tend not to want to associate with those uh, aesthetics. It's very strange. I think it's a it's a perception of power. Um, yeah. yeah uh, for me, it's... Um, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Richard. <laughs> go uh, ahead. For, for me, um, it's location, I think. I was in Mexico, and I think for the time that I was there, it was fantastic. It was like the Krypton test. Uh, uh, it was the most difficult part of the world, I could imagine, really, to do it politically with the strong tourism there. And the beauty attracted a lot of television. So I was on the Discovery Channel like five times. All sorts of TVs that came from China and Japan and everywhere. And so that, that provided a great thing, but it wasn't the place to stay. Where I am now, they've already won a prize in the little coastal town here for the ecology. Uh, and they're uh, healthily uh, competing for the ecology in Brazil. They're very aware of it. And um, there's no winter here, so plants grow all the year round. And everybody will benefit from the floating island as a business uh, with local people employed and um, more revenue, uh, paying taxes and everything, and then everybody's happy. So it, it can really work. And I'm entering the Elon Musk competition. I don't know whether everybody's heard about that, but the deadline for entering the Elon Musk, um, it's $80 million, $50 million for the top prize, the, the, uh, a project that can reduce the, uh, the carbon from the atmosphere the best. Uh, out of all the projects that enter. 
And so I believe we could win this with classic ball floating island concept. If it's explained well, Elon Musk really loves a challenge and going out to the Pacific Gyre with a floating island that can become a continent could be as challenging, but certainly far more rewarding, I think, than going to Mars. And so I think uh, I think we've got a really good chance. So then we have um... money to dish out. <laughs> Plenty of money no, to but, but... out and make work. But... <laughs> yeah, no, uh, but the question also was, uh, do you still consider yourself an artist when open new doors or? Always, always an artist because we need, uh, I mean, God is an artist. Every, every leaf is different in the universe, you know. Uh, every ripple is, you know, every, it's amazing. So. I think we need to follow in the creator's uh, footsteps, uh, always, always be in touch with our divine creator. Yeah. <laughs> but now I also would like uh, to hear about your innovative mind. So uh, how are you utilizing art and innovation for yourself? Okay, well, I, I, I did uh, briefly mention that I made a, wind, a windmill that turned with the wind and it had a horizontal barrel that turned with that windmill. And the water was in there, and the sun shone through the transparent uh, barrel. And underneath that was a trough with broken mirrors recycled from the trash. Uh, and it heated with the sun. So it was a solar heated, wind powered washing machine. And to dry the clothes, you just took them off and you hung them on the bamboo windmill, and they spun around with it. You know. So on a river, it's it's even easier with a water window that turns a barrel and moves up the clothes. Um, I've designed wave powered slippers, and I try to put art in everything, but I think function must follow form. So I think um, uh, function must come first, and then we add the artistic skills, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Peter, how was it for you? Um, what, I, what I feel is that um, at heart, definitely, I feel like I'm a very creative and artistic person. But for our work to exist in the community, we sort of need to respond to what their needs are. So sometimes I will present the work and then if it's a villager, they will be like, oh, you know, I, I, or if, it's, if it's a municipality, sorry, for example, they say, oh, are you an engineer? And I wouldn't. I would try not to respond to those questions, or they will tell me, "Are you a marine scientist, or are you are you a businessman?" And uh, I think the truth is that if we want those projects to be successful, we need to be all of these things at the same time. So I try not to uh, to put a, too much a label on myself and just let the people decide if they if the if the way they approach the work is because they're interested in business of tourism, for example then I should definitely let them build the touristic activities on the platform. If what they're interested in is uh, you know, sequestering carbon and they want to buy carbon credits, then let them do that. If they want to uh, celebrate the local culture, and this is about art and the preservation of their, their identity through aesthetics, uh, then we should absolutely do that. So my, my approach is to let people decide whether this is art or science or design or engineering or anything in between. And um, I don't know if it's going to be successful, but because I'm much earlier in the project than uh, Joy and uh, Richard, so um, that's that's a slightly different approach I'm trying to have. Yeah, thank you so much. Really amazing. Yeah. It also shares my thought a little bit. So Joy, how is it for you? So which experience that you have? Well, what what Caesar said is uh, totally correct. Uh, um, it's it's a symbol, it's a platform, and uh, the platform is uh, the better, the more different people join it. So um, every everybody has uh, its his own um, expectation, and uh, then they will will find, then they will connect on on their own level and topic. So so this is the beauty of these uh, collaborative uh, projects and. Uh, um, it's a house with many doors, and uh, let's just meet together in the middle. Um, but uh, Nicole, I know uh, that uh, you're an expert also in artistic research, and uh, there I would love to um, hear from you about your experience um, concerning uh, art and science. Um, is there a 
Is there a connection between the bo both? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. So Caesar and Richard, um, maybe you know that I run the Institute for Art and Innovation uh, here in Berlin. I did. So oh, wow. What I, <laughs> what I'm trying <laughs> since 2017 is uh, pursuing interdisciplinary collaborations on the intersection of art, science, technology, and innovation. And of course, education or politics come in as well. So um, for, for me, water, you know, is the element and is uh, the kind of uh, medium, I would say, that people could understand maybe on different dimensions, yeah, in different dimensions, on different levels, and by that also um, understand their own potentials, yeah? And, um, and for me, every project is a kind of new endeavor, exactly how you describe it, Caesar, letting people come closer, open up, uh, collaborate, ideate, and really showing up um, what they think about their wishes, their dreams, um, you know, how they would live in the future, also with the waters and so on. And I think by always letting letting them speak and letting them show up, um, we can create these kind of worlds and realities yeah, that we really love to see in the world. I mean, for me at least, yeah, I have really big dreams. <laughs> So, um, and what I what I like is, um, for me, I also try to be as neutral as I can. Or sometimes I say I'm not even a woman anymore <laughs> in the process, just to let the others show themselves, right? So, and um, I, I, I think I see myself more as an enabler, um, and by that, letting the others manifest and, um, and really even be surprised about themselves you know what they really wish for and not being uh, fully dependent on structures and existential issues and so on and so on so rather yeah pulling everything uh, positive out of them in a way you know so that's why i'm really really excited uh, to meet you all here and for me when it comes to art and science um, this is what i'm really interested in because i think at the moment what we face is that the facts are out there since many decades in lots of different fields but humans have not understood what they now should do with all the information with all the knowledge so i think what we are also in is times where we have to aggregate knowledge and we have no tools to do so um, we even have no tools for finding compromises in complex worlds. So um, there's a lot to learn together, in my opinion, and we really have to um, bring everyone to the table, be it a young kid and uh, old man, exactly what you are doing, Cesar, and also Richard and Joy, um, and um, letting them exchange and negotiate, right, what everyone could bring to the table, where they take on a responsibility and so on. And by that shaping the future we really want to live in. And for me, that's why art has to come in, right? Because artists are the kind of explorers and um, be it in the social realm, in the innovation realm, or even in the science realm. So for me, um, there's also artists in science, <laughs> um, uh, which is great. And I think these um, brilliant minds, I mean, everyone is unique, you know, and uh, yeah, they really have to understand that they bring something into the world and we should share the best um, perspectives and the best um, attitudes, right, uh, that we can bring to the table. And um, and this is what I, what I wish for. So what I'm trying also to do is find the right scientists to collaborate with that are really willing to share openly um, and not make it more complicated, right? <laughs> And um, and by that, that everyone really learns in the process, the scientists from the artists, the artists from the scientists, or even innovators from artists or the other way around. But I would love, that's why we also initiated the Social Art Award several years ago. What I would also love is to en empower artists to be more innovative yeah, and be more on the front line <laughs> when we face climate change and other issues. So this is from my side. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, but how do you see that, uh, Richard and Caesar? How comes science into your project? Sorry, Nic Nicole, first, uh, you're one of my heroes too. 
and uh, we have some more really interesting people uh, in the round. Um, I would love to hear something from Daniel also. And uh, Julia has a question. She raised her hand some time ago. So maybe we can open uh, this discussion a little bit up uh, to, to have more people uh, talking. That would be great. Let's do so. So Julia. <laughs> Hello. Hey guys, great presentation. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, it fits really well with um, what you were just saying, Nicole, and also Caesar before, because when you were presenting, all of you, I was thinking, oh, wow, I hope you are together with scientists who then kind of, in a way, second what you're doing and in a way also translate back that knowledge into this more universal format that people can read about it in an academic paper and adopt it in a way. Um, so I had one um, anecdote where I worked together with a, a marine scientist in Sweden and he wrote a paper on ocean acidification. His name is Sam Dupont. And he realized that everybody who will read this paper already knows about the topic and that he can't actually read anybody who doesn't know about ocean acidification with his academic paper. So this scientist became a creative himself and um, he got his paper um, uh, accepted in Nature magazine, but then he asked him to postpone the publishing until just before Christmas when everyone in Sweden eats shrimps. And he had been breeding shrimps in conditions of 2020, 2030 and 2050. And he rented a space in front or in one of the big shopping malls under the header, taste the future and cooked up his shrimps. And people tasted that these shrimps in the acidity conditions of 2050 tasted differently. And they were appalled and they were like, oh my God, shrimps in the future won't taste the same. So in the end, he had international press, national press, local press, and his paper published at the same time. So he kind of created a funnel from a broad audience to his very specific um, topic that made everyone realize that everyone should care about this. And for me, this is one of the best examples of how art and science can work together there. Both was done by a scientist who saw the need to reach out to other audiences. But I think quite often it happens in combination. And in a way, some of your projects um, are clearly an example how it happens. But um, my question is, how do you work with scientists and how do you um, kind of, for example, about the mangroves, I think there the link was even clearest. Um, Caesar was saying he's working with this open science concept, but with the mangroves, I was thinking, wow, who, who is writing a paper about this growth patterns of mangroves on islands? How wonderful is it when we are, can, can reach out into other areas of the ocean with that possibility? So that's my question. <laughs> um. Can I answer that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I looked up online uh, because many people used to say to me, you know, mate, are you doing damage with your plastic bottles? You know, uh, and, and, and is there microplastic coming out of it and stuff like that? You know, but so I had to contend with um, people who thought they knew science, but really they hadn't there's hardly any studies on this, except that. Uh, I did find out that uh, a plastic bottle free floating in the ocean can take hundreds of years to break down uh, into very fine particles. But it cracks up in about 10 years or something like that, but then it takes time to crack smaller and smaller and smaller. But I do know that the floating island plastic bottles don't crack up and didn't crack up. I can say that for... Um, 12 years, I had one island, and they were totally intact, in fact, totally covered with life. We're talking about mollusks on them and all sorts of sea fauna and, uh, and foliage, you know, everything growing there. So it, 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 it becomes a life support, and there's intelligence in life, and the life doesn't destroy what it needs to float. So it's protected by all the life around it. But we need to make that scientific knowledge because it is not. And and there's been um, a prize won by an Australian um, um, reality show creator, but not just that, a documentary creator. She created a documentary on the Earthships. 
probably heard, heard of the Earth ships, yeah. Um, well, she won a prize for that, but then she got into a competition for ITV in England, London, uh, for a new reality show. And she contacted me and she's host a reality show where people create their own unique floating island and then there's a judging process to make it, uh, you know, to fit into uh, primetime TV and all of that. And they basically put it on hold just because of one so-called scientist who just put a doubt in and said, what about microplastic? I had to write a whole article on it and send it to them. But the proposal was done without me even being involved. And if I'd have been involved from the beginning, it's just amazing how little respect I get for people who think they know. But Sad. but this is like in a way this is uh, this is also an answer. This is the opposite answer. So you're not actually collaborating with yeah. science, but you see it more as a friction. Um, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. They yeah. should collaborate with, with us. I'll tell you why. Because yeah, they should. But I mean, you. Every. They're also quite they interested need to, sometimes. They need, they need to. They need to get a bit a bit home more humble and open their minds up. The plastic is destroying the planet, right? Right, that's a scientific discovery that's been made, done, and now they, they, they've been very irresponsible. They haven't created for the cleanup of it, uh, they created for the selling of it, and money was the main thing. Okay, okay, they use science and it's all right and all of that, you know, but we need to realize that there's a responsibility attached to that. And I've come up, and other people too, have come up with great ideas, and oftentimes they get poo pooed, you know, uh, by people who just can very easily just say something and they've got letters behind their name or whatever and then other people can use them and it's we need we need to break through that ice and obviously become be friendly but be take a stand and i have i'm doing that now more and more i really know more and obviously they're sharpening my intelligence on this i go by feeling and i know and it does work uh, but uh, yes, I do need to make it more formally uh, acceptable. But it, but the the, the wheels uh, with inside are so slow, you know. Uh, and it, that, but we need to speed this thing up. You know, we need to find a way of breaking through quicker. And and yeah, did you see what I mean? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Welcome. I also would like to give the word uh, to Caesar, uh, how his relation is to science and scientists. <laughs> yeah, I'd say um, right now the the well, first of all, I'd like to to uh, resonate with uh, Richard because uh, I do see in conversation uh, because I'm also in academia that uh, when I'm pre when I'm introduced sometimes as a scientist, sometimes introduced as an artist. But there's always uh, when if people had to make a choice, they always prefer to introduce me as a scientist because there's societal perception that science is more important than art and more valuable and more you know respectable. Uh, and I really think that's actually really damaging. I think overall for the collaboration, if you want to have a good collaboration, we think we have a, have a healthy respect that we can help each other. So I think that's really the baseline that I'm trying to establish. But uh, psychologically, it's very difficult to establish this uh, uh, equal uh, relationship. So I think that's really important to 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 mention because I I think I, I do feel in uh, you know what Richard is saying. Uh, the way that I, I'm sort of uh, managing this relationship is a bit uh, different, is uh, because right now I'm even though I don't have a background in science, uh, I do a lot of work which is more in the field of engineering, I'd say. Um, but I'm also managing the money of the project. And so because I'm fundraising for the scientists, then I'm almost in the position of being the funders. And so the relation, the power, then it's a different power dynamic because I'm managing the project overall. But then that also means that I have to respect their scientific integrity. So it means that I have to completely defer to the expertise all that is scientific. And uh, I found a lot of pleasure uh, in um, having them prove my assumptions wrong. Uh, for me, there's, there are very few things in life that I enjoy more than being proven wrong. And so um, so I, I love to to work with the scientists and being challenged by them. And um, what I can tell you now is that the project is becoming bigger. And so uh, the scientists that I'm working with, they have been working on the topic of hydrogen for 25 years. 
And so they are funded under a national agenda for the energy, which is like those national massive budget for the whole uh, economy and the country of Indonesia. And it's going to become the fourth most populated country in the world. And so they, they're going to become the, the fourth biggest con consumer of energy uh, eventually in about 50 years. Um, and so the scientific approach is very uh, procedural. It's like we're going to do step one, step two, step three. Uh, but actually, if you look at the hacker uh, or the designer uh, mind, mind, mindset approaches is typically trying to find a scenario of usage. And this is where I use the artistic side. Okay, we need to have cultural acceptance, societal acceptance, and then we can bring in the science and engineering. Because if society cannot dream that this is possible, uh, no matter how good the science is, the, 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 uh, the, the people will not uh, accept this, uh, this new technology. So... Um, so what I in, in that context, that's a yeah. magical trick, uh, seeds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and the, the difficult, it's, it's the, yeah, it's future prototyping, right? And by that, inviting exactly. every perspective into the process. Yeah, I really exactly. love that. <laughs> and so the difficulty is then is to have a scientific integrity because if you are controlling the money and the vision, then you're also potentially biasing the science. So we basically we have to respect each other territory and and collaborate and and it's it's difficult always difficult because everybody feels that you know they are, they are the overarching sort of logic so sociologists would tell us you know eco economists would tell us it's something else and you know so business people of course they tell us business is the most important ecologists will tell us ecology is the most important so we have to manage all these ex expectations. Yes, and I mean, we live in these complex times with, with wicked problems, we need this systemic um, approach, right? And when it comes to system innovation in the big scale, let's say, then we are newbies as humans, so we have no clue at all how we should deal with that. So, yeah, I'm really happy <laughs> to share uh, perspectives here. But now I also would like to um, ask Budi, what is your question or your comment here? Um, I really appreciate all the um, presentation. Thank you so much for all those. Um, it's uh, in inspiring and also um, makes me scared, <laughs> honestly, because of all the challenges that's ahead of me if I want to build my uh, floating island schools. Uh, first of all, um, I might need your guidance, you guys, because it sounds to me like you guys able to um, convert a theory to practice quite practical and easily it's, it's from my perspective but i know there's a lot of challenges that you encounter but i'm 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 trying to like uh get some uh so form of like floating structure by end of next year hoping that i can present it um on this conference also but uh, my question it will be um i know there's a lot of nuances that you have to juggle that you mentioned and you have to like raise funding uh, for some pioneer and start uh, starter and like people who doesn't have the floating that they just have their vision and ideas where uh, what is like the action item and step by step processes that you would you recommend uh so for someone like me for example um any of you uh, maybe uh, could answer that. Thank you. Richard, you like to go first? <laughs> you are muted. Sorry. Richard? Yeah, it went, the signal went off for me. So I don't know what just recently went on. <laughs> uh, would okay, you like me to uh, uh, ask the question again, Richard? Yeah. Okay. Please. So my, my question uh, in summary will be, um, for pioneer uh, or like the future captains, how do they get started and what should they uh, prioritize or uh, what are the action items um, basically? Okay, well, if you're, if you're heading for the ocean, um, it, it's advisable for me uh, to go to the port captain uh, and let them know at least what you're planning to do. Um, the good thing is, uh, is that you don't need to get a permit. I think it's everywhere in the world, more or less. Um, maritime uh, law basically says that you can build a boat. You can build any floating artifact, anything. So, um, But if you want to actually start maneuvering on the, on the ocean, uh, then you do have to register it. So it's quite simple, that really. Um, and and the, for registration, you just need to be able to... Um, maneuver it with a rudder and uh, some, some form of propulsion. You know, it can be a sail, it can be whatever, you know, or it can be towed. 
Yeah. So, um, and I think that I would suggest definitely start with planting uh, green on it because you get the power of nature on your side and the power of people understanding that you're trying to do something ecological. Whereas many, uh, quite a few people that have been in touch with me uh, ignored my advice and just made a floating structure and then the authorities stopped them before it was in the water or just after you know. So, but if you if you make it green, um, firstly, it just looks more beautiful. And then you get the power of wanting to do something good ecology on your side. On the whole yeah. Does that Thank answer you. your question? <laughs> No, Caesar. Let's uh, let's yeah, to, to I, Caesar. I, I, what would be? Yeah, I would say I would say the same is that um, don't let uh, money, you know, the lack of resource, be your your enemy. Um, the lack of resources is your friend in the sense that most people in the world don't have resources, and so sometimes having too much resources leads you to doing uh, some invention that are irrelevant to the majority of people on the planet. And I think both Joy and Richard are using recycling material. Myself, I unfortunately I experienced homelessness uh, when I was a researcher, and um, and I will continue to build prototype using uh, material from the trash, and uh, work in a squat in in London, and I think I did some of my best work when I was uh, the least equipped to to do it, so I would say it's so I would say like start something very small, uh, because nobody is going to invest in you unless you make your first investment of your or demonstrating your own character. And using material that are around you, which makes which makes it relevant to your context. So uh, you don't need. I don't think you need the permission. You just need to get uh, enough energy and muster whatever you can find. Put something in the water, and then you will learn by doing. And people, the community will naturally come around you because you are doing something. And so few people are actually doing something. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, buddy. Live the old American dream. Just do it. And you will see who is your <laughs> friend and who has something against. And from uh, there on, yeah. you can uh, manage. <laughs> and it's Thank always learning, yeah. By... Yeah. Yeah. learning by yeah, doing. Yeah. Woody, what... Learning <laughs> by doing. That's that's basically what I do a lot of time. Yeah. I I um I am very inspired by the structure organization that uh, all of you have, and then like being able to be pragmatic at the same time to be true to uh, your vision. I, I definitely want to try to like, um, you know, follow your footstep in certain way. Although um, my way is uh, right now, like, like what you say, like I had to struggle a little bit, like in like, just continue with the vision because of what you say, like lack of resources, but now I'm like on the better position. That's why I'm like, I have more, um, energy toward like moving it to more practical level. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Woody, for this question. And now, Daniel, um, what is your comment or question? Yeah, thank you. Now, I was asked by um, uh, by Joy to to um, talk a little bit about the activation of global networks and how um, yeah how one can. Uh, build even alternative networks and organization and open it up to um to a very like um let's say easy step and approach and I feel like it really fits into all of the last comments and I would like um first of all to to introduce you a concept which is called open social innovation and then give you a little bit of, uh, an example um of what we um what we uh, of what we're going to do and how how to use it because um um. And um, so, what um, what and how this this concept um, is? I, I put it also already on the on the uh, on the board of um, of today's uh, yeah on the mirror board of today's workshop. It's actually so we we should ask ourselves not only the question what we give in and out, but also how does the the uh, yeah how does the outcome affects our our direct stakeholders and most of all the the society the civic society yeah so what does it mean concrete because i like to do things concrete yeah so what we did um during the uh, during the covid pandemic uh, were creating huge hackathons yeah there were like 42000 people in germany 
following this concept, uh, uh, following these these process I'm going to sh uh, show you now. And we did the same hackathon um, uh, three weeks later for um, uh, in Africa for the AFDB, um, where 25,000 people participated. So, and it's actually straightforward and it, it aligns with what uh, Nicole said about creativity, design thinking approaches and stuff like that. So it's first of all, building an alliance uh, or identifying a problem. And then it's important to really identifying the problem, but only think in solutions and really gather already existing a solution and then think, okay, where are, uh, where are levers of change? Yeah, where, where, where are things possible to create networks about and then go into the deep dive as we started now and see, so what kind of uh, solutions are possible? And after you have done this, then you actually begin to understand the, pro uh, the system, put all perspectives together and then you are able to really go for scale and build scalable prototypes. So the process itself is quite easy. We can do it like today. Yeah, we came up with three really great prototypes, but now it's really about um, yeah gathering the the know how the uh, which is here in the in the room, which is really amazing. So thank I I really learned a lot today and building partnerships. And to really commit to a minimum, yeah, not to commit to a maximum, but really commit to a minimum and don't do lesson learned, but do commitments for the next week, for the next month, for the next conference, yeah, and then uh, present the solution and scale up for change. And yeah, to, to change the, the system, it's always good to to maybe have some, um, yeah, some, some big organizations in order to to also find alliances in, inside of them. And um, especially uh, the artistic approach in climate change, it's also brought in by, by Kirsten Dumlop, um, who, who really has this, um, yeah, this European Bauhaus approach um, and uh, yeah, a, a huge perspective for artists itself. So what I, can, what I can say, and then it's enough theory, it's like take a, a holistic approach try to understand the systems yeah when you model them and then see which which like levers of change you actually can can create um, in order to uh, to scale the prototype and we were talking a lot about islands and that was our our concept where we went to the cop last year but this year we put the island so to say on the bike and created a um, mobile uh, storytelling for resilient communities yeah, I posted it already in the chat. You can see it. You can download the QR code, and uh, we already created a pilot, uh, a pilot for India. And what what we did, and this is how we started a huge engagement. There were over thirty thousand downloads already on this app. It's to make it very easy. Yeah, so engage the community, um, support, learn from each other, broadcast your ideas, and then find. Um, find unique um uh, yeah find um yeah find maybe one thing for you it's the islands for us it's a creative velo and uh and a choir who is uh who is connected in over 300 schools from all over the world singing uh on the cop uh a song um with maybe billy irish um and um in their their uh language um yeah so it's all all just an entry point and um, how we how we go about it and create our theory of change, yeah. Um, I think this is also maybe no. I'm going like this. Yeah, it's like to build a community, get campaign parameters, um, develop some guiding principles, and then use like your vision of an island or ours of this um, of this um, creative yellow uh, in order to. Um, yeah, to to have a certain step, yeah, of filming a documentary or bringing in your your um own prototyping ideas, and um going uh, for for innovation, uh, collaborating campaigns, um, and also give them tools uh, where they can yeah develop uh, a bottom up approach and also find ways to fund themselves. I think that's very important that you give the responsibility. I mean, it's great if Elon Musk gives us uh, 18, uh, 80 million, but it's also important to to gather gather the crowd and convince them of the of the use of the project, and then 
uh, yeah, then you can um, you can uh, create your own little systems. Yeah, exchanging skills, um, understanding, applying, uh, analyzing, and then um, evaluating the process and go over and over um, it again. So, so my advice is uh, would be really to um, uh, to um, yeah, uh, create uh, in your teams a minimal commitment. Yeah, uh, and then uh, once you have this, try to find action uh, and meeting points where where small teams meet, and then um, yeah, accelerate the process uh, uh, by by uh, meetings and organizations like that. And then I think you can you can really um, scale up the process and maybe find some non obvious um, solutions like. Uh, this Creativello on each island, which I would like to see in order to try, uh, find another transmitter to spread um, ideas um, in the world. So that's that's like my my two cents. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, Daniel. And um, yeah, that brings Did me you... also to uh, another question. First of all, um, uh, what kind of collaboration are you seeking at the moment, uh, Cesa and uh, Richard and all? others that are here um, and yeah what do you um, what kind of expectations maybe you also had uh, from this conference <laughs> Cesar you are muted sorry for me the first first for sure was to learn um, like joy like you what you guys do is very inspiring to me and I really want to just to stay updated with the things that you do and then there's always new young interesting people that are joining this conference so for me it's it's mostly about learning and just seeing you know what's what's going on out there um yeah and of course if i can update the, this work that i'm doing and if people are interested in your know, green hydrogen and mangrove uh, carbon sequestration then i'm always uh, you know open to a new collaboration thank you so much richard yeah i uh, i think this is fantastic it's the first time i've been involved in something well organized and the fact that joy is even an artist like me he, i was a street artist for many years as well so we have so much in common and uh, i'm so happy to be involved with this and i believe we can make massive strides in a short space of time uh, just uh with this going you know just keep the ball rolling it's a snowball effect right i think it will work especially because it's winter now there <laughs> but uh, yeah, and people people long for the tropics here where there's no winter at all, and so uh, I can have visitors here. I can sleep um, backpacker style, uh, two people. So it can be a couple or two friends, and um, and they could volunteer and stay and just enjoy. I've opened a little restaurant, a little vegetarian restaurant. So I'm into creative food, and we have all sorts of amazing fruits and roots and seeds and herbs and spices that I have never knew they existed. And they're just the ones that are in the shops. And I have a friend here now who knows the jungle stuff. And so we have amazing things happening right now. And so it's all exponential, you know. So it's the beginning, but that can soon, rent is so cheap here. You can buy a hectare of pure paradise rainforest here on the edge of a beautiful river leading to a fantastic resort 20, 28 kilometers downstream for $1,000. 100 meters by 100 meters. Amazing, <laughs> Richard. Richard, I'll definitely it, visit totally you green. in Brazil yeah. one day. <laughs> yeah. So, what about you, Joy? What kind of collaborations are you looking? I, I can't uh, hear. And what kind of partnerships? The signals gone off. <laughs> well, last year, last year we started um, uh, with with uh, the hackathon uh, you organized with your institute. We we started the float generator. Well, the internet signal is not the best here. <laughs> uh, the float generator with which which is an um, citizen science kind of um, 
uh, platform where we where we uh, are collecting uh, knowledge um, that can be applied on on these islands, and uh, this is something we definitely will continue to to develop and uh, to share. Um, th this is something which uh, helps all the makers out there on their specific ideas to to see. Um, who who else has um, faced this problem or has found a solution? So there are already some platforms, Afropedia, for example, uh, where, where is a, is a huge collection of uh, of manuals and uh, knowledge, open knowledge. So this is something we we're gonna work on, um, and um, it's always it's it's a uh, it's a matter of motivation. I mean, if if I do it for myself, I I don't see the reason uh, to to spend so much time. So if if we can um, join as a community, as a as a uh, float tribe, then um, all of us will be more motivated to uh, to share our. Um, our knowledge, our experiences, and uh, to to share our questions, also to get feedback, um, and uh, this is something which uh, um, helps me to to follow this uh, this way, and um, to um, not only to do things because I'll, I'll do it anyway. And uh, we we have a growing community here in Hanover, and uh, thank you all for being here, to being with us. And to sharing this vision, and uh, uh, it's so great, um, so beautiful people. So I I have my benefit with the community on location, but there is much more we can do. And um, I I know about uh, others in in uh, this talk also in Malawi. They have uh, problems with their lake, and uh, the solutions are out there. So why not uh, put it together and uh, start with the easy manual how to build a floating island for inland waters. And uh, then the purposes are different, but the solutions also. And uh, the best solution is always to combine different benefits, to have mangroves or vegetation on top, to have uh, cultural events to engage the community, to have maybe a tourist resort or, or an artist in residency uh, opportunity. Uh, and then with the international community in these countries, in Africa, in India, I know it, uh, if, if you can say it's an international project, the people will listen. If you just do it by yourself, you have no chance in India. But as an international community, uh, it's, it's marketing, it's just an image, it's uh, nothing special. <laughs> but uh, we can play this game. And um, then uh, it will help all the different groups to speed up their efforts to, to, to get more attention and uh, and to have somebody, some group uh, for feedback and advice. And even if I face a big problem, it's good to know where I can, uh, with whom I can share my problems <laughs> or the ideas. So I, I want to invite you to leave your email address and uh, we're going to work on, on the mirror board and uh, make a paper out of it and share it with you, whatever you do with it. Um, but uh, then we have a start to collect this uh, knowledge. And uh, however, I mean, we could do this conference every year. November is perfect for us. Outside it's cold. So let's get global. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anyone also in the group uh, who wants to share his or her thoughts on the global partnership, let's say? <laughs> I I think um, I, I like the presentation about the open collaborations. And I, I remember one time we had that uh, wiki uh, idea. I wonder, uh, Joy, can you explain if there is any uh, movement on that? Um, just like... Uh, sharing knowledge, sharing resources type. Uh, we, we started uh, this wiki um, and uh, I think I even shared uh, the link on our website. I, I have the link to, to this wiki, but uh, so far uh, the response was very little and um, our own time also had different priorities. 
So this is something uh, to be done, um, or maybe um, another system would be easier. Maybe it's it's not it's not a wiki, but but a, a Facebook uh, page where we just uh, post uh, interesting links. So it's more it's more easy to to just uh, share information on on one channel, or the Telegram chat or some other messenger. Maybe maybe it's a good question in 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 the round. Uh, what is the best um, communication channel for collaborative uh, collections or, or projects? I would recommend you Notion use? because you can make it very easily and spread the plot, uh, spread like uh, informations uh, and build different undergroups. So for, for the huge uh, global networks and information, uh, I, I would suggest Notion uh, for the, um, like for the, uh, um, uh, Daniel, for the but it's not for free, right? There's no free it version. It is. It is? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Notion is for free. It's, uh, it uh, even has an AI application that you can use it. So that's very easy. So the, for the front end, I would run Ocean, and for the back end, uh, for the communication or the internal group, I would suggest something like uh, Slack or um, whatever, or Teams, something like that. Yeah, that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge Notion fan, personally, so, <laughs> so I, would, I would be favorable to this. But about the international aspect of it, I think there's also a political dimension uh, recently, I've been doing a lot of collaboration with uh, Iranian uh, colleagues. Um, and you know, in this time where there's increasingly uh, war, um, I think um, symbolically building this floating island, uh, because I'm, uh, I mean, I'm close to South China Sea, is very symbolic, right? And, and so I think for a lot of people, what we do can, can be something that they want to latch their imagination on. And so if in our community, we can manage to have people from a different background, uh, different, you know, Israeli, Palestinian, <laughs> Indonesian, uh, Western people collaborate together. It can, it can be a huge victory in the sense that we can we can be a, a place where people can, can collaborate together. We can demonstrate that. I think it can also have a, not only a artistic, scientific, but also like a political a symbolism attached to it. I think is very important as well. There, there is interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh... that, yeah. <laughs> Um, th there was a, a German artist, uh, I think Günther is his name. He he worked in the 90s on an art piece. Um, it was uh, called The Refugee Island. And um, it was just imagination. Um, and uh, he just calculated uh, if if the refugees all over the world would be a nation, it was it would be the third, the third biggest population in the world. Wow. So he, wow. he thought about... Um, um, artificial floating continent, uh, a nation, the refugee island. And this was just fiction, but uh, but he's true. I, I met him in New York once and asked, uh, why why don't you realize it? And he looked at me, uh, how, how could I? But uh, <laughs> actually we could. And we could build a supranational um, island, decentralized, mm -hmm. not in one place, but all over the world. And uh, then it would even be some some kind of global network where you could uh, you you would have a community wherever you go. Uh, when I was uh, doing uh, some uh, work with my students in architectural school in Hong Kong University, I showed both of the work of Richard and the work of Joy um, as an example for what we could do with the Rohingya in Cox's Bazar. And my students, some of them build uh, design some you know floating gardens. And um, I mean, it seems it seems like it could be a useful thing, like you said, like humanitarian technology. So uh, I think I can't help but think that one of the biggest success that we could have is that if we help, uh, in even even a very small way, because there's like you said, there's gonna be, and there's gonna be so many more hundreds of millions of climate refugee are gonna be you know on the road, uh, already on the road. So um, yeah, I think that should that should be where we should focus our efforts, honestly. I, I wonder also uh, if there is a way for us to support you uh, you guys um, what would that be and what what's I mean what's next um, 
for example, for Joy, uh, Caesar, and Richard. Um, and then the next thing question would be like, if there is a milestone that we all as a community um, should uh, be focusing on as part of that uh, collaboration portion globally. I have an idea. Um, maybe we can uh, publish, maybe we can collect interesting groups and projects all together um, and then uh, next year publish an ebook about uh, floating futures and uh, i'm so sure that all of these groups will be delighted to be published with their project in this ebook or maybe we we find a publisher but uh, this this could be a really good um platform to to go on from there and uh, i love that idea um it's, honestly it's, I, that's probably a way for us to do the fundraising using that um uh, materials any material that we can can publish and and th there's an issue with ip as well but you guys know about it <laughs> if we connect all these um creatives and uh, makers and engineers they will give us the ip and um if we if we use uh, this as an um, open source project, uh, if there are, uh, if if we can earn money with it, we can we can just uh, give it to the project of all of them who needs it most. So it's it's a non-capitalistic uh, project. And then we yeah. won't have problems. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately. Our conference is over, <laughs> but we also pursue to the captain's dinner, but that will be without our virtual audience. I mean, on YouTube or wherever it is screened. So I would like just now to say um, a big thank you uh, to all our friends, visionaries, innovators, and all attendees who have contributed to the success of the Floating Futures Conference and Vision Workshop. And we extend our heartfelt gratitude for your active participation and valuable exchange of ideas and wisdom and knowledge. Your dedication has created a wave of inspiration that resonates with the spirit of innovation and collaboration. And it's so great that we could co-design, co-create, and now also hear from you. And as we celebrate the diverse projects and visions shared during this event, we invite each, uh, each one now of you to join us for the captain's dinner, a virtual gathering for networking, lively discussions and further exchange of insights. And hopefully, Budi, you also get your question answered and feel the ripple effect of change as we continue this transformative conversation. Let's collectively shape the future of floating projects and explore the possibilities that lie ahead. Thank you for being such a crucial part of this journey. And we look forward to seeing you at the captain's dinner where the conversation continues and the future unfolds. Thank you so much for being here yeah. with us tonight. Thank you so much, Nico. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. It was quite interesting. <laughs>